to the organizers for this wonderful invitation to this sunny Glasgow. Uh, it's a new place for me. So um, I start slowly by putting what is the agenda for today. So basically, if you follow up this, what is happening in this one board, then you can forget about the rest of the board. So what I will try to do is just give a, a bit of a definition and the motivation. and the motivation for classical secure multi-party computing because maybe it's not the Spanish concept in this community. But as you would have imagined, the bit of the crypto, when we are talking about the status of classical secure multi-party computation, there is a problem. So what is the problem, at least from our point of view, what is the problem there is that the security is breakable. Sorry for my handwriting, but it's just one word. Breakable in a post quantum world, the data quantum exists because most of the existing schemes for the classical secure multi party protocol are used either RSA or discrete logarithm or elliptic curve, etc. So the day that quantum computer is built, they are built, they are broken. So, what are the solutions? So, the solution for this problem, uh, uh, we know it is that. There is one solution that basically the classical crypto people are uh, pursuing, classical crypto that is uh, lattice space or <coughs> code based or multivariant. I'm not going to talk about them, but you have probably heard of this thing. These are the class of new protocols <coughs> that are believed to be secure even the existence of quantum computers because a couple of very clever guys try to define a quantum algorithm for them and it doesn't work. So that's, that's where people are uh, working at it and you could immediately see that, well, okay, fine, I mean, they, there is a still solution even with this alternative solution that they are remaining computational secure. They are always computational secure. Okay, so fine, I mean, maybe this is, this is the domain of uh, lobbying is like, good enough because it's computation secure and it's quantum resistant. But then another more interesting, again for us perhaps, is that there's issue of efficiency. So when I'm talking about SMPC and when I go through the talk, you will see that the, the fact that these protocols are supposed to be efficient because they are used for auction, they are used for an actual world application. So we don't want to deal with the non-efficient case. And the moment you replace things with this lattice space and this beast, they are not efficient. Again, the way that classical crypto are looking at this is, well, okay, it's not efficient because it's only a couple of years that we have to start working on it, and we might uh, improve them, and that's quite likely, and that's the status of work, that classical people are trying to come with the alternative method and making them more and more efficient. But what we guys, I mean, some of us are doing on the quantum domain, so there is other solution, which is quantum crypto. So in this quantum crypto approach, I mean, you know, if you look at the history of quantum crypto, and you're probably going to hear more about it also tomorrow from Stephanie, that there's lots of lots of crypto, uh, protocol and gadget that has been constructed, you know. You can start with the QKD, then, you know, at least goes out, I put one QT, this was survival con, and there is a device independent that you will hear a lot tomorrow from Stephanie. There is various protocols, secret sharing, so, um, and I will talk about some of these things that is relevant to the <coughs> quantum secure multi-party computing that we have been constructing collectively alternative uh, block, block, uh, block uh, building blocks that can help us for quantum secure multi-party computation. So what is the problem in here? Of course there is also a problem here. The main problem here is that we need a quantum computer. So here, a quantum infrastructure some technologies because it's more a fancy name to say. So that's that's where it is, the status of the world, and what I'm 
hoping that towards my talk I show that, that the, the real nice story that we can start looking at is that there is a hybrid solution can come. So we can pick up a little bit of the pieces that is in here, a bit of pieces that are coming in here, trying attack, perhaps boosting a bit of security, boosting efficiency, and coming from a hybrid, uh, classical, quantum, hybrid, classical, quantum, uh, enhanced, secure multi-party computing. <coughs> That's the target of my talk. So I try to show you the element that is there, we do not obviously have a solution that is a very nice hybrid solution that is showing boost, but I think there is a common um, line of research along that direction. Any question? Okay, so let's, let's go through it uh, to see how it will go. And as I go, there is, there is two elements to this hybrid approach, either going from classical circuit multiparty to the quantum one, or going from linearity to non-linearity, which for some of you guys already know this audience, they can guess where that's heading. Okay, so what is secure multi-party computation? Well, secure multi-party <coughs> computation is that you have n parties, they want to compute some uh, joint function of uh, x1 to xn, where each of these xi are their secret, their uh, <coughs> private secret. So the idea is that <coughs> up to t parties might be malicious, might be trying to deviate from the protocol, might be the bad guys. And you want to make sure that at the end, when we go through this protocol and we evaluated the function, which is the output is broadcast to everybody, each of these parties don't learn anything more than the output. So that's, that's, the, that's the target of secure multi-party computation. Okay, so ideally, you know, the, the reasonable model that people define <coughs> security, which takes a long time, a long history in the classical uh, uh, field of uh, research to come up with the most natural definition, is that you have a real protocol that is implemented, which has lots of communication between all these parties. Some of them are good guys, some of them are bad guys. You don't know, they might change, they might become good, they might become bad, colluding each other. But eventually, you want to prove that your protocol have exactly <coughs> the same property as if there was a trusted Google in the middle, that you could send all your data to Google, and then Google uh, compute for you the function and send it back to you. And if you can show the property of the, <coughs> so basically you want to show that, you know, the proof technique for uh, one of the protocols go through it is that the adversary who is trying to manipulate and deviate from the protocol should not distinguish, this is like a thought experiment, the adversary should not be able to distinguish whether I'm in this scenario or I'm in that scenario. So you need to construct a proof technique that shows that you know, from the point of view of somebody who wants to deviate, I don't know, am I talking to the trusted party with communicating with the uh, good guys, or am I in the case of the real protocol? So that's, that's our definition. That's, that's the best we can, we can hope to get the definition. So what is the adversary trying to do? That they're not trying to screw up the computation. They're just trying to find out. No, the they secret. could do that. They could do whatever. And actually, that's a very good question because when we talk about the security definition, there's many, many different flavors come. Whether you want the correctness, you don't. You want the privacy. Mm -hmm. Whether you want the fairness, maybe they're actually happy to follow, but they want to get the data before the other person to get and make the other people not to get the data. So there is very, very different flavor of the security comes. But in the most general case. If, uh, if I don't specify what kind of adversary I'm talking about, it means that anything, you know, they, they could have any general malicious behavior that you could possibly imagine in your malicious mind. So, so there must be bounds on how many adversaries are allowed. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's, that's the classic result, you know, that we're going to, to see. So just, just to give you motivation that this is, this is one of those, you know, uh, useful protocol, it's not just theoretical protocol, in a, in a sense, and it's such a general topic, you know, is, uh, that anything that you can think of that a bunch of guys want to achieve some common goal in the presence of the bad guys, that basically secure multi-party computation. And as Prakash was mentioning, depending what is the goal, depending how bad the bad guys are, depending at what level you want to go, you will have the different level of secure multi-party computation. I'm just listing it, like, question from, uh, question from, all the field from error correcting codes. You can think of error correcting codes, in fact, a secure multi party computation. You know, is your device is the malicious device, and you want to, despite of the malicious number of device, you get your computation to go right. So that's, that's the same thing.
interesting and if you use the lot distributed the algorithm and the complexity theory that extracts the tool system, PCP theorem, randomness and distraction, whatever you can think of it. And in particular, the, the part that is even more interesting and come back to my vision of going to efficiently doing something with the quantum tech is the practical application. The most exciting one is the blockchain. We, we spent last week in a nice summer school uh, in Greece, which we're talking all about blockchain, and blockchain technology and Bitcoin are some particular way of secure multi-party computation where malicious guys have incentive to build and mine the coin, but to some level, and you know, voting, auction, data mining, anything that you can think is basically secure multi-party computation. So it's pretty useful to try to make progress in this direction. And what is the state of art? Not really giving you the complete list of how the story started, but we know that information theoretical security exists, and you can have a um, unconditionally secure classical secure multi-party computation if there is a threshold, as Prokash alluded earlier, that is the, um, the threshold of the bad guy that they are uh, supposed to come to each other and break the protocol is less than half of the uh, people, or if you are given uh, oblivious transfer as an element. Or there is the other type of testing is that you have computational security assumption, you know, like in RSA, some function to be hard using one way function, and that there you don't need to put some sort of majority construction. So these are these are the current <coughs> state of art, and the thing that we will care apart from the security in the post quantum world, we also care about the efficiency measure, and this efficiency measure when we really talk about the actual implementation. Communication between protocols, I mean, you don't want to have too many communication with everybody. There is the wrong, there is computation. How much randomness you can extract and well, what the resources come. So there is all these various measure of them that ideally you want to improve when you go to the quantum world. Okay, so what is quantum secure multi-party computation as the first system? Well, quantum secure multi-party computation is exactly the same thing as a classical one. That again, you have a bunch of parties. You can think of it as if they want to, I mean, the function is, uh, I pre-agreed, there's a gigantic quantum circuit written in the Cooper, and everybody is uh, having their own particular input to be sent to the uh, server in charge of one part of the different space, and uh, the output is announced. And again, you want to make sure that except the party who is in charge of a particular wire in your circuit, nobody else will learn the value of that. Okay, so it's the same notion. Okay, we need to go through the details, saying exactly what does it mean, I don't learn anything, in which norm, in which distance, but it's more or less the same concept of like the parties should only get, yes? Well, secure, classical security is uh, that what is realized by the multi-party computation is indistinguishable from what would be, from what would be realized by trusted third party. Is this trusted third party a quantum computer yes. this time? Yes. To the definition that we can put is here. So when you're assuming the most general, I mean, again, even there, you can create the zoo of the different definition. You might want to put just the classical trusted party, that is actually one of the things I want to talk about. It would be enough for some particular protocol. But in general case, I'm not just yet uh, go to the proof. You know, you can, you can assume that everything that is existing classical, you can just extend it to the quantum part. And different notion of security would be achieved, whether you make a trusted third party. Quantum, and you can even you can imagine even you go beyond quantum theory, which we uh, you know just put the non signaling in trusted party uh, if you want. Again, the same thing up to T parties can do. Then each of these PI should learn essentially nothing but the output. Okay, so what is the state of art in this case? So I mean, so I mean there have been lots of other paper about quantum secure multi-party computation. I'm not really following the historical one and just mentioning something in order to know what we have. Really similar to the classical case, the information theoretical security with, uh, when the threshold is less than a half has been achieved by Ben et al. work. And the assumption that is needed for this particular quantum secure multi-protocol, which you know, which is the standard one, is that you need to have now pairwise quantum channel. Instead of just having classical channel with party, you need to have quantum communication between all the party. And you have also classical broadcast channel. And the really important thing which will come back is the complexity of this algorithm. Okay, yeah, so complexity obviously is polynomial in the size of the circuit that you want to compute, but they are not complexity. Okay, and the usual element that was used is 
also the same building block that classically used, i.e. verifiable quantum secret sharing. And then the novelty was how to run computing and authenticated code. So every party that is running it would be able to see that the computation of the other parties run correctly. So these are the toolkit that is used. And then, <coughs> and this, uh, also there was another set of work comes by uh, Dufour, Nielsen, and Salawai et al. that they use also, very similar to the other information theory and security, instead of using the oblivious transfer, they use the AND box, which is very similar to the uh, local boxes. So if you're given this as an element, so this is a building block that is given, like, like all, all this transfer, now you're given the AND box, so one party can put A, one other party can put B, the box securely produced for you X and Y, which X is never sent to Bob, and Y never sent to Alice, such that the parity of them is AB. Using that primitive, they show that they, you can also do information theoretical security, uh, two-party secure computing, and also extendable to the multi-party <coughs> So these are, so far, is exactly the same level as we had in the classical world. And again, you have pairwise quantum channel between players and the complexity of the protocol polynomial. And also the same technique of using computation and authenticated code has been very essential to do this. In a sense, as you would expect, there is a commonality between all of these quantum crypto protocols that we have that it's some sort of combination of uh, encryption using one-time pad plus some teleportation. You know, this, this, these are the two things that it keep uh, popping up in, in this technique, but you need to use uh, various error correcting codes. Okay, so that's, that's where we are. So what am I going to talk about? So since my mission is just to reach to somewhere that we can put the best of the both world together and coming up with practical, so let's, let's first go to the quantum secure multi-party computation. And, and I mean, I have not even motivated. Maybe we want to have quantum blockchain. Maybe we want to have uh, quantum voting. I mean, whatever you can think of it, that there is an advantage to build quantum in this distributed way. So the first uh, element that we want to resolve and sort of optimize on the previous result is that we do not really want a pairwise quantum channel between all the parties. That's too much infrastructure required. They want everybody to be able to send quantum state to everybody else. And it's sort of the communication complexity, but it's also in terms of structure. Even in classical, people are going more to what is client server based, that you know you don't have everybody capacity or the same capacity with the other one. Everybody can communicate just with the, some central center, not a trusted center, another malicious center, but it's sort of like a centralized. And also, this polynomial overhead, let's, let's uh, reflect on it. Polynomial overhead is good for complexity, but in reality, imagine that we want to run, for example, our distributed search algorithm. The advantage that we get over the classical computer is only quadratic. So if now your distributed setting is requires some polynomial of unknown, I mean, even if it's n to the 3, you're already, there is no need for you to do it because you're already losing the advantage that the quantum was supposed to promise to you. So I want to be sort of wishy-washy argument so that your uh, our secure multi-party computation or any other this sort of protocol, they really need to aim for linear overhead, which is what I'm going to show you. Because, you know, it's not, it's not just a matter of I want to have polynomial, I want to make sure the advantage, if my quantum algorithms are just <coughs> polynomial advantage, not necessarily exponential advantage, and I want to use them in this hybrid approach that, okay, there is some, some quantum things that come as a protocol, a sub-protocol to be advantage. We should not plug it on top of this, some sort of extra overhead, especially with the fragile number of qubits that we will get in the, in the coming years. So uh, what is the main technique to allow us to optimize on top of these two things? I mean, re removing the quantum online communication as well as the overhead is that with slightly different uh, approach, instead of going with this authentication code, which has been used, uh, polynomial authentication code, which is very nice property, but it's very, very complicated, as uh, developed uh, by various groups, we are going to use the technique of verifiable universal blind quantum computing, which is another sense, is another authenticated code, but uh, it has different properties, like instead of having authentication and done computation on top of authentication, we do computation and done authentication on top of it. This is a slight uh, change of the order and uh, we gain uh, in the complexity. So that's the, that's the approach that I want to show you. And as a result, we no longer need online quantum communication between all the parties. The picture would be that everybody just needs to have an offline quantum communication with the center and the overhead is linear. Okay, so this is, this is it. Is, uh, the rest of the thing is just probably just to show 
how all this is achieved. But that's that's the main uh, point. Any question? Okay. So quickly, just to remind you, because probably you heard a lot about measurement-based quantum computing, and uh, one of the founder, Robert Rassendorf, is here. So there is this beautiful model that my career is built on, which is measure-based quantum <laughs> computing. So you have a classical control machine, then you have your quantum resource, that the classical control machine is like, uh, by using classical input and output, is manipulating the computation. So in this computational model, program is encoded in the classical control computer, computation power is encoded in the quantum state of it. So why this is so cool? Because then it's very easily, you can also start putting some hiding property on top of it. In order to hide program, in order to hide your computation, you just need to do a little bit of the encryption without necessarily going too much to the hassle. Literally, you just need to have single encrypted qubit plus classical bits because you just need to hide this uh, control level of machine. So this encryption is your encryption of every single message that is part of your program. If you like, it's a garbling, as you will see, garbling your computation or encrypting your computation. Encryption, I guess, is creating this sort of random single state, which are offline, is independent of everything. And then you have the classical one-time part of it. So the real technique to hide computation in measurement quantum computing is that you are doing classical one-time path, the best way to securely hide anything classical program. But in order to be able to run computation on top of it, like computation mm -hmm. authenticated, you give the key. But you should not give the key of a quantum uh, classical one-time pad, really. So you give a quantum key. <coughs> and in fact, this quantum key cannot be extracted too much information apart one bit, which you can hide it again. So that's, that's the usual, uh, usual trickery that you can use. And so far, so good. So this way, you can get unconditional perfect privacy. Server doesn't understand what you're doing. And the, the real structure is that you're doing computing and uh, using teleportation. As I said, one-time pad plus teleportation. These are like elements that you should be using in the future. So, and then these are the angle computation. So, then what else? We need to have some kind of authentication, some sort of verification for all of these construction to do, that people are following what they are supposed to do when we go to the multi-party setting. And the idea is that, well, like in the most simpler way, so I'm running sometimes computation, or sometimes I'm running a test, sometimes computation, so I'm running test. The test could be some clipboard computation that I know the answer. The computation could be some quantum simulator that I don't know the answer. And then you put on top of that a blind uh, masking, which now I don't know which one is test, which one is the computation, and you prove that it, you give the right answer for the test, and then overall you're giving the right answer for the whole computation. So, so far so good. So in, in a sense, blindness reduced the verification problem to a simple error detection code. And that's, that's how we differ from the authentication, polynomial authentication code that we have really the most trivial way of single error detection code built inside uh, the computation that we have. So we can check whether the computation is correct or not because we're just doing the detection. Okay, so far so good. So um, quickly, just to give you the property of this verification, because it's become important for the building block of all the rest of the protocol that I'm hoping to show you in the next several minutes left. So you have, in the particular case of the client server, there is some randomness, they have the exchanging, sending information back and forth, they have some output density operator. The idea is that no matter, back to the question that uh, Prokash is asking, no matter what the strategy the server has, in what maliciousness he wants to have, you know, Markovian and Markovian, um, as long as obey by the quantum rules, you want to make sure that you do not end up to be in the case that the protocol tells you everything is fine, okay, good, you know, accepted, whereas you actually computed something in the orthogonal subspace. So this is, this is where you are fooled, so you want to make sure the output density operator that is produced for your protocol has a very low chance to be in this bad subspace. And this low chance is basically computing a trace over all the possible random variables that the uh, client has. So, and this is the parameter of security. Okay. So, here's come the here's come the fun. So, the first claim is that we want to have the protocol just to be from one party, all these multi-party protocol to go. Oh, it's okay now. Not multi-party. One another element. So now, the first element is just how could we make sure this verification, authentication code that we're developing is uh, linear? Because for a while, the previous result that we had, it was the best result that we had was n squared. 
Although n squared is not much a deal, but if you go and talk to experimentalists, they still don't like you. You know, n squared overhead, you know, when we're probably going to get is still 10 qubit for verification is not uh, good enough. So in this work, you uh, joint work with uh, Petrus, uh, with all the audience, we develop an alternative resources state, which allows us to build this verifiable blind quantum computation with only linear overhead. And it's a bunch of fun with rough theoretical things, so uh, it's in a sense, it's just local construction versus global construction that we had before. So if you want to have a computation, let's say that you have a line computation, it's just like a one bunch of qubits that compose each other, and you want to have attached uh, trap, the test run, you know, I want to have computation and the test run, computation and the test run. If you want to construct this thing masked blindly to the server, you construct this thing that was very imaginative, we call dotted triple graph. Because out of each graph, you can create the three copies of it, whereas by adjusting this red to be either connecting a wire or breaking the wire, you can, in effect, have this graph, whereas the server thinks that you have that graph. Well, this graph is still is not ideal, because it's still you're telling to experimentalists to construct that, but let's deal with that uh, in another time. The, the minimum thing, we know that the overhead that this graph has on top of the uh, computation for verification is uh, linear. And the other nice thing, development that uh, we had uh, recent uh, work by Vedran, uh, John work with Vedran, is that before the blind quantum computation, all of these things required a variety of a state being 0, 1, or you know, plus theta from a discrete set. But if you really gain push to quantum technology with it, you want to minimize it to something that is already implemented. And now we know that for these protocols, the state that the client, the verifier, all of these parties that want to play can do it, it's basically DB84, plus and minus and plus I and minus I. So, in a sense, this protocol are giving us from the point of client or a point of the verify the minimal state that is required. So, now what can we do with this? So far, it's just everything is of the uh, um, previous kind of result that existed. What can we do with this thing? It's just So let me tell you about the Yao garble circuit. So one of the first protocols that actually started the field of secure multi-party computation was the Yao protocol, the millionaire problem. You know, you know, Trump with whoever else wants to know who has more money and then, then they don't want to announce their results, so, but they want to go through this protocol to know which one has the bigger function. So this is a secure two-party computation. My secret is uh, uh, not known, but the outcome is unknown. And uh, this protocol, which was in one of the very, very most efficient, yet most efficient uh, two-party secure computation. So how does this protocol look like? So Alice has a secret input and is garbling a program. And I'll tell you what I mean by this garbling program. And here is the server, I mean the other part. So the garbling is basically saying that, okay, they, they agreed about the function, like which number is bigger than the other one. So now they just need to make sure Alice need to insert his um, her own secret input, and then send this garble to the server to server to run it. So how does it uh, the encryption work? Depending for each of the wire of the function that you need to compute, you have a, for the value zero you have one particular secret key. For the value one you have another particular secret key. So now you're computing, you're evaluating all the possible computation in advance, saying that okay, if the input is zero and this input is zero, then I know the output is supposed to be zero because this is an AND gate, so I'm encrypting with this key and this key, the F1. And you create this table for the, all the possible outcome of each of the garble circuit, and then you send this thing to the server, to the evaluator. So this is this, all this garbling of each of the gates is just for me to make sure that my input that I have already hardwired in my circuit is hidden. Yeah. It's a very neat uh, algorithm. And now, when the server obtained this garble circuit, using an uh, oblivious transfer, now he can put his own secret uh, input, B. Whereas because it's with OT, the Alice doesn't learn the uh, input of the uh, server or evaluator. And because it was uh, encrypted in this particular encryption way, uh, the Bob doesn't learn the input of Alice. And then, what will happen is that the server is evaluating it. So there's a couple of nice things about it is that 
the fact that the client job is very, very simple. And this garbling is not evaluating the circuit. It's just very constant, local, gate-by-gate -gate, uh, encryption. So the client is doing a very simple evaluate. The garbler is using a very simple, compact, constant, logarithmic depth, if you want, garbling computation. And the job is done on the server side. Okay? And what is the property of this computational secure? Obviously, because uh, so first of all, we need uh, uh, oblivious transfer to be able to run this thing. But on top of that, this encryption is computationally secure. So there is two places that this thing can break again in the quantum setting. That the encryption can leak information because it's no longer having that property. And the fact that, okay, OT, we have only computationally secure OT. And also, the security of the protocol is also only known in the so-called honest but curious adversary. So the YAR protocol, which is the most efficient protocol, can be working if as long as all the party follow the protocol, but they might try to learn something more out of it. Why this protocol is still used a lot, as you will see in the, I mean, you can see, I mean, if you search a bit, is a, is a very nice, neat construction that can be used in so many other constructions. There is much better protocol come afterward, which is considering, as I say, the Benoit et al. protocol in the most general uh, adversarial setting and with various assumptions. However, YAO is still the main, the only protocol that has the linear construction, linear overhead for running it. So what do we do with when we want to construct a verifiable quantum YAO garbage system? And if you have followed what I've been saying so far, which seems the only Prakash is listening, but uh, basically all the element is already there. The only element for us to construct a verifiable quantum YAO garbage circuit is more or less the same thing that I show you as, and it's, this is another work in the toy work with Petrus, that now all I need to do is just the all um, Alice and Bob to also insert their input. So Alice has now a secret quantum input, and the garbling circuit that we want to run is now a general CP map. So how does the garbling work? The garbling of this gate by gate is for each of the gates that exist in my wonderful measure-based quantum computing. It's like I need to have some sort of rotation of the state in that form and some, some extra zero one for the classification. Then I send my garble, then I send the garble, and the evaluator, i.e. the bob, is supposed to entangle them in this dotted, what is it called, dotted triple graph, and insert, now this is the moment, I'm cheating a little bit, but don't mention anything, but just, uh, the server is inserting uh, his own secret input into the, in the garble circuit that is achieved. And now the server is going to evaluate and run the computation, exactly as before. The difference is, now there needs to be classical communication. So this is the, this is the difference with the classical YAO. Classical YAO is wonderful, it's non-interactive. I just send my verbal, run the evaluation, and get the outcome. Because, and the reason for it is that in this case, we have to have this classical communication, it's just because we have boosted security. Unlike the classical YAO, our efficiency is unconditional secure. So we do not have this encryption, which has, depending on some, some encryption, uh, the gate it goes. So it's unconditional security because basically it's one time path plus teleportation again. This is the magic of the, the whole thing. So because it's one time path as a teleportation, I, but because of the same strengths, now we have the weakness that the protocol is classically communicating. Yes, the CP map is that when it's encoded in a measurement based quantum computation. Yes. Is that you take the purification of the CP map? Oh, you, you don't take it. No, you just let, let it be unpure. Okay. You, 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 can, you can have it. You can think of it as like, it's a non-deterministic MBQC computation <coughs> that is a CP map. Depending on which branch you are, you are ending up to different linear function, and that's exactly those branch decomposition is the, the same decomposition of your cross decomposition for your MBQC. But probably that's not the way you implement So. So we don't need any uh, oblivious transfer for the insertion of the QB. We have unconditional security, but the life is not like it. There is a price for all of these wonderful extra things that happen. First of all, as I said, is uh, interactive, although the interaction is still linear, so it's still the overhead reasonable. But the real reason that this sort of strong result is okay <coughs> is that because we are in a more restricted setting, which is the quantum honest but curious, which I'm going to talk about it, which is more restricted than the classical honest but curious. So in a sense, we are restricting much more this bad guy, Alice, 
So he's restricting the way that Alice could cheat. Alice might try to garble the wrong circuit. So Alice literally is supposed to follow everything as it's uh, supposed. It's stronger than the classical Yao. But you get these extra things. And I, I will discuss about it, how you might benefit of it. So this notion of quantum adversary uh, was uh, formalized in the original work of uh, who I taught. So the maliciousness, the malicious is what we say that can deviate in any way that it wants. But the spacious, quantum spacious is the something that they define as equivalent of the classical honest but curious. So the quantum spacious, in a sense, need to follow the protocol. And every time it asks, I mean, it can do whatever it wants. But every time I come and ask as an audit, OK, what have you been doing? Should be able to locally to reproduce the quantum state that the real exact honest protocol could have produced. So it's very uh, strong. So I mean, when I come for an audit, you better have uh, you know be ready to reproduce the state that I would have expected you to do, and that restricts you pretty much to do what you're told to do. So in more formally, so an adversary is a spatial, uh, uh, is epsilon spacious. If there exists a family of CP map that I can do whatever I want, you know, trying to map my state at the step i to deviate. But if the audit comes, I should be able locally, by acting only on my quantum state, I'm the bad guy, only act in my local state, to bring it to exactly the state that I was supposed to bring. And exactly means, you know, taking the norm distance or diamond distance, whatever you prefer, to be in the epsilon distance of the exact behavior. So by putting this, um, they already uh, asked in their question in this paper of 2010 that what class, I mean, we know that secure to party quantum computation unconditional circuit is impossible. And it's exactly like a classical model. I mean, bit commitment is impossible, quantum bit commitment is possible. But however, implementing of quantum unitary in a multi party thing, it's raised the question that can we have less cryptography assumption if you're considering a spacious adversary? And we set up this question by saying, no, we don't need any cryptography assumption. Basically, if you are dealing with spacious uh, adversary, you don't need to pick up any more uh, classical principles. So, this basically bring me, wh what am I with my time? Oh, doing well. Okay, we're doing well, whatever that means. I don't know how many more slides I have. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so, the security model, as I said, is uh, the usual uh, model exactly coming from the classical, maybe ask the question, and answer the question of which class well that you are again in this two-party setting, you know, the actual protocol has communication between one now. If I want to make sure my adversary cannot distinguish whether I'm in the real protocol or I'm in sort of trusted party, you need to, sh you need to assume that you have an <coughs> ideal box, which is exactly doing what you wanted to do. You construct a simulator, these are all uh, thought experiments, that the bad guy cannot know Am I talking to a simulator who is simulating my view as if I'm in the real protocol, or I'm actually in the real protocol? So you need to make sure that these two scenarios are indistinguishable from each other, and that's exactly the proof technique works. So you just need to construct a simulator. So you construct a simulator, so look, if the bad guy in the actual protocol is going to send this qubit, then my simulator is produced another qubit, which would be indistinguishable from the qubit that is sent in the general real protocol. So, uh, picturally, that is more or less you can think of it, like, as if I have an ideal box, the trusted party, the trusted quantum center, which I just need to give my input, and this uh, trusted party will give me the expected output, I have access to this magical box, and now I want to create a simulator that the bad guy would not know is talking to the, uh, to the ideal box plus the simulator or in the actual protocol. And then, when you go through the details of protocol, because everything is based on la -la -la, teleportation plus one time pad. So you just need to, instead of sending the qubit that the protocol requires, you just send a totally mixed state part of a PR pair. And the measurement that the server in the normal way would have done it is just a random measurement because I can reproduce exactly this much, but they are totally mixed state from the service point of view. So it's a little bit of a maneuvering on the thing, but just these are the simulators. So in the, for the quantum Yao, the simulator, instead of sending this plus theta state that the actual protocol is sent, the simulator sent part of the bell pair, and it lets you have, well, whether I'm sending a plus theta, which is theta is randomized over eight possible thing, and it's totally mixed state, or I'm sending half of a pair pair, they are indistinguishable because they're totally mixed state. And then I'm giving you a random delta, 
which is randomized because of theta, but it's a random delta, so simulator doesn't know the real actual delta of the actual uh, good guy, but it just simulates a random delta to send it to this one. And then there is the issue that I need to open the key because everything is encrypted. So even for open the key, I, I can reproduce. This is, this is the time that I'm calling my ideal box. Now I need to actually give the output back to the simulator. Well, now I'm going to call my ideal box. Say, oh, please tell me what would have been the output of the correct uh, functionality, and then simulator put an encryption on top of it, send the state as if the protocol has been computing the same thing, and then later on give the key to it. So the constructor simulator is not too bad, it's just understanding the schools are hard. But once you do this, you know, you're in business. So, and then the main property which allows to show this, this simulated view are indistinguishable, because I said that you need to, the view of the actual protocol and the view of the simulated protocol should be indistinguishable. That is where the verification technique comes. Because in the verification technique, we know that the state that the server is obtained is absolutely close to the actual state. We are not in that bad subspace that I could have been accepted or been more about. Because of that property, I know that I'm absolutely close to actually what I'm supposed to do, and you can wire that into the proof. Okay, so, uh, and then you can, you can extend this to the secure multi-particle computation. This is a work, a work with Anna that, so now, instead of having just one client, why not to have many kind of clients? And each of the clients send their, their randomized part of the qubit, they send it to the server, server need to put all of those randomized qubit that this comes together to wire them together to create a state which is now not a, just a single key of a one garble, is a key which is collectively from all the possible clients as the key. So it's a collective key of all of them uh, sitting there. And then you construct the MPQC computation on top of it, which for each of these qubits, everybody has sent their own uh, private key. And because of this, everybody contributing to the encryption, you need to have classical secure multiparty computation to compute the function. So in this case, why this was no longer listening to me, but I would have told them, yeah, the trusted party is only classical trusted party that we need to have it here. Who, who are the adversaries in this scenario? Is it the server? Anybody. So in, in this particular case, it's a, it's a very good question. So in this particular case, adversary could be anybody, including the server, mm -hmm. I mean, although it's not putting it. And the proof that we have so far got it is that uh. we need to make sure the client server they don't produce this uh, part of it. I think we, we have some sort of idea that even if the server gets in bed with a bunch of the client, what we can do, we need to put some more the verification part of it. But the thing that we focus in here is the simpler, because I don't have actually any verification. So people can actually, the bad guy here, could make the computation be wrong, and it's not detected. Mm -hmm. But then it's very efficient, because everybody just needs to put their one part of the key. So now if I want to make sure this colluding between client and server is not in the picture, and I have correctness, then I need to do some more work. So that's where it is. So let's do a little bit of hash This is the easy part. Now so we can. The relax. part is: is there like a condition on the majority have to be honest? And well? we need to have one good guy. Just one. Just one good guy. So because for the one good guy, we can make sure. I mean, okay, I didn't give you the precise definition. What what the property here have? One client, if it's a good one, make sure uh, can we can prove that no matter what, the rest of planets are uh, against him, as long as the server and the client don't get together. The secret of that client is secure. So either you make sure that the server is trusted, which is a quantum technology hub in Oxford, they're building it, Ian Wamsey is very well respected, trusted, so then it's fine, the, your, your data is secure. Or if it's, um, you know, the wave and sort of thing, then you need to make sure that your server is not colluding with the other client, and then, then you can show that that particular client is still secure. So it's very weak. Basically, I mean, out of the, all these fancy words, I want to say that the fact that, that there is two assumptions, that the server and the clients, they don't get colluding. And in such scenario, every honest person is protected, no matter how many bad guys in the picture. But they are not together. So colluding, getting together and exchanging quantum communication. Yeah. yeah. Right, so as long as they're separate. Okay, right. Yeah, and, and the reason is in so this case... So they have cases, to be separate and then honesty or dishonesty is an extra constraint. Yeah. The reason is it's very different than the Benoit protocol because now we are committing, I mean, we are not committing, we are sending all of our qubit to the server. So now if the server measure those qubit, if, for example, if you put some sort of uh, noisy storage model or something, if those qubit are uh, measured and they are gone, then it doesn't matter anymore if the server trying to share something with the other client. But at the time that I'm start exchanging and releasing, getting the key to out, the server has those original qubits and we are in trouble because we have not found the 
technique, but I think in all of them, as I will discuss in a second, things, the, the solution is just putting some extra layer of verification, which is more or less what I wanted to say. So what I'm saying now, perspective, in the first part of my talk, how to go from classical, no, 10 minutes. <laughs> Perspective from classical to quantum. So the quantum Yao protocol versus classical Yao protocol. This is non-interactive, which is fantastic because it's very useful for lots of uh, delegated computation. This one has this boosted security under the carpet, some some uh, weaker assumption. So the idea that we have is just to add some classical verification, the technique of cut and choose that is very the standard part of it, and then. By doing that, we're sort of creating a sandwich, a club sandwich that we have the classical verification, then you put our quantum yaw on top of that, and that itself provides a method, maybe we can run the classical uh, multi-party computation. So can we use this thing as a more efficient way of doing, for example, to secure party computation, because something is boosted. Of course, for all of these things, you need to have compositional security proof is needed to deal with this, lots of other hassle, but the real idea in here, the perspective is that can I use a mini quantum yao, you know, the 40 qubit machine that Google is going to announce by the end of the year, to construct a little bit of the quantum yao and then the element put this thing inside the classical uh, secure multi-party computation and really sit down and calculate if you get any gain or not. So this is the first part of the game. But now you would say, well, still my quantum blind computing, I needed to create this MBQC, connecting things together and a part of it constructing. So is even with mini computers, you need to still have lots of entanglement into the picture. So can we do something with only very few qubits? And that's, uh, that's again, a quick perspective of what's happening in the classical MPC. It's very um, enlightening that, first of all, the first large scale practical experiment with the MPC was really recent, in 2008. I mean, in the classical world, real efficient application of MPC is very recent. But then, if you look at, if you dig into the, the recent meta, I mean, there is tons of paper coming in the MPC, as you would imagine, but people really want to make them efficient. The, the most common way that you can see that the classical MPC are constructed is that you take your computation function, you write it as a multiplication addition and solve some fields, and then it is always the case that the addition is done very easily, You're using some sort of linear verifiable secret sharing, and the multiplication is hard and costly, using offline fully homomorphic encryption, of what's not, and etc. And if you look at this a little bit carefully, and if you look at what uh, lots of other people working on contextuality have been doing this, it's, like, it's more or less the same thing. And that's what I want to talk in the next 10 minutes. So mm. classically, the efficient MPC is constructed of how to take up something easy, linear, additive, and then add non-additivity on top of it. And, voila, and that's exactly something that we know in MPC again can be done, from linear to non-linear in this the original work of um, Janet Anders and Dan Brown, that they show that if you restrict your classical control machine to be only x or x, x or y as the computation, and your qubit computation to be GHZ, uh, then you can get out of this very simple system a universal classical computer. And since all my life I'm just following what Robert is doing, it, so, so there is another set of work that Robert started working on it, and then Abramsky, Samson, and others uh, look at it and things regarding sort of extending that idea that we know that if a control machine is basically a linear function evaluation, the only way to boost this linear com computation to a nonlinear function is using any contextual state. So this is more or less the necessary and sufficient condition. So if you put here the contextual could be just the state, could be whatever things that give you this notion, if you can go from classical linear to the non-classical linear. So now that we have an MBQC, it's not much job to construct the same thing in a secure multi-party computation. So first thing we did in order to go from this linear to non-linear, doing it a secure uh, computing. Literally, just bringing a little bit of crypto into the picture, that I'm not only I'm talking, computing, boosting linear to non-linear, but I'm doing it in a secure fashion. I'll skip the secure land because that's not a important uh, <coughs> part of it, although it's implemented. Uh, but the real picture is this, that I can now, if I want to go really following the same classical secure multi-party computation construction, we need to follow the same technique, okay? So we have the linear construction, that now I'm going to use the uh, secure multi-party computation, the classical one, because they are very efficient structure that exist there. And now, in order to boost that one to, to a better nonlinearity, instead of going using via FHT and all the funky things that exist in the classical domain, we're gonna use either single qubit or GSA or contextual. So let me just show you one example one as a 
as the beginning of the fun is that you know if you if you play with the same sort of you know kind of we fun, fun, fancily enough we call it the perfectuality in time but it's not just JSON state so if you take a state plus and look at this correlation which are the local applying this local rotation and uh, whatever where it comes from okay so if, if you if you look that calculation then you see that what is happening you have only linear computation of the parity on the operation that you're computing. However, the function that you have evaluated by sending just single qubit around is a nonlinear function, which is this nonlinear function. Multiplication and addition is sort of totally useless, modular form, but it is nonlinear. So, and then you just add local masking a technique because your, uh, your local operation is just Clifford, so you can just by applying the Z, you can localize it, and that's, oh, voila, we have a very simple secure multiparty computation for a function that is required only single qubit. And again, this single qubit is exactly the same thing as the contextual you get from the GSS. Or more or less so this, this to me seems at like the beginning. So we can we should be able to find lots of more other such functions. Because now in here, my algorithm requires that somehow this party to be able to compute in a distributed fashion their XOR, which is a linear function. But now they're going to use up a very specific uh, classical technique that is way more efficient. Because if you remember the perspective that I was saying, if you just want to do addition, it's easy, efficient. But the moment you want to do multiplication, it's hard. And multiplication is done quantum. That's the message, basically. So now here's the next club sandwich that we have the classical linear SMPC. So there's plenty of them is there. We're adding some sort of contextual <coughs> state around it. And that allows us to compute in a uh, secure multiparty computation and non -linear. And now we need to sit down and calculate it, the efficiency of it versus other classical technique. And the, the thing that hopefully is interesting, finally I say something interesting for this community maybe, is that the um, resource analysis. So I know that there is lots of experts, I mean, we hear about some of their talk tomorrow, I said it, that they have been done a lot in the non-crypto setting, if you like. How we can look at this contextual, what the sort of correlation sit in here, what how much amount is there, and then you can see that depending on which function you want to compute, maybe you need more communication, maybe you need more correlation. But those resource analysis would be very useful in order for us to now compare it. What will happen in such scenario if it was in the classical case? So I think this resource analysis could be, again, in this perspective of the hybrid thing, become useful. So in a sense, we use that part to see to do this hard part, and we continue with that race. while. Classical people try to improve their efficiency of the FHE and lattice-based crypto, etc., whatsoever. Maybe we can also improve the resource that is required for the sun in reality. And I need to say even more perspective. So how are we going to implement this thing? Basically because I'm paid by this, all these hubs, I need to advertise them. So we, we have the, a lot of investment in UK to run the communication hub and to run the computation hub. And the vision is that using this communication hub, we need to be able to send exactly all the qubits that the client requires to send, because they are basically BB84, and this is the QKD network. And once all of those QKD network states are coming from uh, each of the hubs to the Oxford, which is doing the computation part, we have all the elements for our secure multi-party computation. But let's see how many qubits we get. And with that, I stop. Thank you. I wasn't going to ask you a question, but you pointed at me. So you mentioned uh, fully homomorphic encryption in passing. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and you were saying perhaps that if we used it, we could do more stuff. But doesn't blind quantum computing already subsume <coughs> the power of FHE? No. It doesn't? Because blind quantum computation is interactive, uh, whereas FHE is non-interactive. So I it's see. exactly similar to that. I mean, what blind QC is really, I mean, at the beginning I was saying it's the same as FHE, but I'm not learning it very well. So now I know it's actually Yao. So, uh -huh. because in the Yao protocol, you're really garbling it, and the, the, pro the problem of FHG versus blind computation is that, or basis garbled computation is that, for each gate, you need to send your encryption, which is exactly the case we have in blind QC. Whereas in FHG, the encryption is independent of the complexity. However, in another talk, I would tell you how some of this technique might be used to boost it. In a sense, mm. there is things within FHG that they are bottleneck, and maybe can we use our quantum Yao to attack some of these things, but they are separate. 
because of this interaction and the part of the this. Okay, so, so maybe, so maybe, no, but what, what is this trusted third party here is not what you, I mean, is a different, we're talking about a different thing here, it's just an entity, it's not the real thing, so it's, you're assuming, you know, when we implement, the ideal functionality which yeah, but, to prove yeah, but, but when I'm proving the uh, protocol, there is no actual trusted third party, it's not really, we don't have a real quantum computer which is acting as a trusted <coughs> party, so all the parties are talking to each other, if each one of them has a mini computation whatsoever, so the trusted third party is some, uh, definition that we put in order to show this indistinguishability. I mean, so it's, it's not actually, I mean, maybe maybe I come to that and say, okay, now maybe I don't have a trusted third party, but I have a quantum computer that I'm sending all of this data, which is this sort of client server that I'm putting in, then we can come back to your question. But in terms of security proof, it's just an element we're saying that I want to, to show. I mean, it's, forget about trusted third party. It's like I have the ideal box. So now you can ask the question of what is the best definition for this ideal box. I'm saying that somebody has given me a box that I'm putting my quantum input, and out of it I'm getting my expected quantum output. How realistic this definition is and what it means is something else. But right now I'm taking that as part of it, and I show that if I have access to this ideal box, which doesn't exist, but the protocol could not distinguish, the adversary could not distinguish whether I'm um, in that scenario with the simulator ideal box or I'm an actual protocol. Yeah, it's just, Clear away 